law one, never outshine the master judgment. Always make those above you feel comfortably superior in your desire to please and impress them. Do not go too far in displaying your talents, or you might accomplish the opposite. Inspire fear and insecurity. Make your masters appear more brilliant than they are, and you will attain the heights of power. Transgression of the law. Nye Fuke Louis XIV's finance minister in the first years of his reign was a generous man who loved lavish parties, pretty women and poetry. He also loved money for, he led an extravagant lifestyle. Fu was clever and very much indispensable to the king. So when the prime minister Jules Mara died in 1661, the finance minister expected to be named the successor. Instead, the king decided to abolish the position. This and other signs made Fuke suspect that he was falling out of favor, and so he decided to ingratiate himself with the king by staging the most spectacular party the world had ever seen. The party's ostensible purpose would be to commemorate the completion of Shadow, but its real function was to pay tribute to the king, the guest of honor, the most brilliant nobility of Europe and some of the greatest minds of the time. Le Font, Madame attended the party. Mock wrote a play for the occasion in which he himself was to perform at the evening's conclusion. The party began with a lavish seven-course dinner featuring foods from the Orient never before tasted in France, as well as new dishes created, especially for the night. The meal was accompanied with music commissioned by Fuke to honor the king. After dinner, there was a promenade through the shadow gardens. The grounds and fountains of Vaux were to be the inspiration for Versa. Fuke personally accompanied the young king through the geometrically aligned arrangements of shrubbery and flower beds. Arriving at the garden's canals, they witnessed a fireworks display, which was followed by the performance of Moyer's play. The party ran well into the night and everyone agreed it was the most amazing affair they had ever attended. The next day, Fuke was arrested by the king's head, Musketeer Dart. Three months later, he went on trial for stealing from the country's treasury. Actually, most of the stealing he was accused of, he had done on the king's behalf and with the king's permission. Fauquet was found guilty and sent to the most isolated prison in France high in the ESE mountains where he spent the last 20 years of his life in solitary confinement interpretation. Louis XIV, the Sun King, was a proud and arrogant man who wanted to be the center of attention at all times. He could not countenance being outdone in lavishness by anyone and certainly not his finance minister to succeed. Fauquet Louis chose Jean Baptiste Colbert, a man famous for his parsim, and for giving the dullest parties in Paris. Colbert made sure that any money liberated from the treasury went straight into Louise's hands. With the money, Louis built a palace even more magnificent than Futz, the glorious palace of Versa. He used the same architects, decorators, and garden designer, and Versailles Louis hosted parties even more extravagant than the one that cost Fauquet his freedom. Freedom, let us examine the situation. The evening of the party as Fauquet presented spectacle on spectacle to Louis, each more magnificent than the one before. He imagined the affair as demonstrating his loyalty and devotion to the king. Not only did he think the party would put him back in the king's favor, he thought it would show his good taste, his connections, and his popularity, making him indispensable to the king and demonstrating that he would make an excellent prime minister. Instead, however, each new spectacle, each appreciative smile bestowed by the guests, on Fauquet made it seem to Louis that his own friends and subjects were more charmed by the finance minister than by the king himself and that Fauquet was actually flaunting his wealth and power rather than flattering. Louis XIV Fouquet's elaborate party offended the king's vanity. Louis would not admit this to anyone, of course. Instead, he found a convenient excuse to rid himself of a man who had inadvertently made him feel insecure. Such is the fate in some form or other of all those who unbalance the master's sense of self, poke holes in his vanity, or make him doubt his preeminence, observance of the law. In the early 1600s, the Italian astronomer, and mathematician Galileo found himself in a precarious position. He depended on the generosity of great rulers to support his research. And so like all Renaissance scientists, he would sometimes make gifts of his inventions and discoveries to the leading patrons of the time. Once, for instance, he presented a military compass he had invented to the Duke of Gonzaga. Then he dedicated a book explaining the use of a compass to the Michis. Both rulers were grateful and through them, Galileo was able to find more students to teach no matter how great the discovery. However, his patrons used usually paid him with gifts, not cash. This made for a life of constant insecurity and dependence. There must be an easier way. He thought Galileo hit on a new strategy in 1610 when he discovered the moons of Jupiter. Instead of dividing the discovery among his patrons, giving one, the telescope he had used, dedicating a book to another and so on, as he had done in the past, he decided to focus exclusively on the Mechai. He chose the Michis for one reason. Shortly after Como, the first had established the Medici dynasty in 1540. He had made Jupiter the mightiest of a gods the Medici symbol. 
a symbol of a power that went beyond politics and banking, one linked to ancient Rome and its divinities Galileo turned his discovery of Jupiter's moons into a cosmic event honoring the Mechai greatness. Shortly after the discovery, he announced that the bright stars, the moons of Jupiter, offered themselves in the heavens to his telescope at the same time as Como II enthronement. He said that the number of the moons four harmonized with the number of the Medic cheese. Como II had three brothers, and that the moons orbited Jupiter as these four suns revolved around Cosmo, the first, the dynasty's founder. More than coincidence, this showed that the heavens themselves reflected the ascendancy of the Mechai family. After he dedicated the discovery to the Michis, Galileo commissioned an emblem representing Jupiter, sitting on a cloud with the four stars circling about him, and presented this to Como II as a symbol of his link to the stars. In 1610, Como II made Galileo his official court philosopher, and mathematician with a full salary. For a scientist, this was the coup of a lifetime. The days of begging for patronage were over interpretation. In one stroke, Galileo gained more with his new strategy than he had in years of begging. The reason is simple. All masters want to appear more brilliant than other people. The producer of a great work wants to feel he's more than just the provider of the financing. He wants to appear creative and powerful, and also more important than the work produced in his name. Instead of insecurity, you must give him glory. Galileo did not challenge the intellectual authority of the Medicis with his discovery or make them feel inferior in any way. By literally aligning them with the stars, he made them shine brilliantly among the courts of Italy. He did not outshine the master. He made the master outshine all others' keys to power. When it comes to power, outshining the master is perhaps the worst mistake of all. Do not fool yourself into thinking that life has changed much since the days of Louis XIV and the Mechai. Those who attain high standing in life are like kings and queens. They want to feel secure in their positions and superior to those around them in intelligence, wit, and charm. It is a deadly but common misperception to believe that by displaying and vaunting your gifts and talents, you are winning the master's affection. He may feign appreciation, but at his first opportunity, he will replace you with someone less intelligent, less attractive, less threatening. Just as Louis XIV replaced the sparkling Fauquet with the bland Colbert, and as with Louis, he will not admit the truth, but will find an excuse to rid himself of your presence. This law involves two rules that you must realize. First, you can inadvertently outshine a master simply by being yourself. There are masters who are more insecure than others, monstrously insecure. You may naturally outshine them by your charm and grace. No one had more natural talents than a store Mount Freddy, Prince of Finza, the most handsome of all the young princes of Italy. He captivated his subjects with his generosity, an open spirit. In the year 15 Zare Borgia laid siege to Finza. When the city surrendered, the citizens expected the worst from the crew of Borgia who however decided to spare the town. He simply occupied its fortress, executed none of its citizens, and allowed Prince Manfredi 18 at the time to remain with his court in complete freedom. A few weeks later though soldiers hauled a story Manfredi away to a Roman prison. A year after that, his body was fished out of the river Tiber, a stone tied around his neck. Boer justified the horrible deed with some sort of trumped-up charge of treason, and conspiracy. But the real problem was that he was notoriously vain and insecure. The young man was outshining him without even trying. Given Manfredi's natural talents, the prince's mere presence made Borgia seem less attractive and charismatic. The lesson is simple. If you cannot help being charming and superior, you must learn to avoid such monsters of vanity. Either that or find a way to mute your good qualities when in the company of a cheer Borgia. Second, never imagine that because the master loves you, you can do anything you want. Entire books could be written about favorites who fell out of favor by taking their status for granted. For daring to outshine knowing the dangers of outshining your master, you can turn this law to your advantage. First, you must flatter and puff up your master. Overt flattery can be effective, but has its limits. It is too direct and obvious and looks bad to other accords. Discreet flattery is much more powerful. If you are more intelligent than your master, for example, seem the opposite. Make him appear more intelligent than you. Act naive. Make it seem that you need his expertise. Commit harmless mistakes that will not hurt you in the long run but will give you the chance to ask for his help. Masters adore such requests, a master who cannot bestow on you. The gifts of his experience may direct rancor and ill will at you instead. If your ideas are more creative than your masters, ascribe them to him in as public a manner as possible. Make it clear that your advice is merely an echo of his advice. He must appear as the sun around which everyone revolves, radiating power and brilliance, the center of attention. If you are thrust into the position of entertaining him, a display of your limited means may win you his sympathy. Any attempt to impress him with your grace and generosity can prove fatal. Learn from foot or pay the price. In all of these cases, it is not a weakness to disguise your strengths. If in the end, they lead to power by letting others outshine you, you remain in control instead of being a victim of their insecurity. This will all come in handy the day you decide to rise above your inferior status. If like Galileo, you can make your master shine even more in the eyes of others than you are a godsend, 
and you will be instantly promoted.